is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Good morning. How are you today? I hope you're doing as well as I am. I feel pumped. I'm back on TV. It's not that I want to do this on a weekly basis. I'm, I'm actually enjoying semi-retirement. But Alex is doing such a good job, there's no way I'm going to boot him off now anyway. So it's important that I get these breaks for Alex to, you know, he's traveling, uh, I believe, uh, down toward the south where family is, and spending Thanksgiving with his family. Um, so it's exciting to have this opportunity. Uh, I believe I have four weeks to share these lessons with you. And I didn't get quite finished last week in my lesson, so I want to pick up where we left off. We're talking about uh, sitting around the table at Thanksgiving, and I don't know how many of you did this, but right before dinner, everybody says, well, I'm thankful for, for this. I'm thankful for my new job. I'm thankful for uh, my family. I'm thankful for my church. And then everybody goes around and shares something. And then we give thanks by asking God to bless our food. But I asked last week, when was the last time you heard someone thank God for the disappointments they've had in their life. Doesn't happen, does it? We don't usually bring that to the forefront. We usually only talk about the blessings we have received, and yet our disappointments may be blessings in disguise. So that's what we started with, and we looked at the life of Joseph and how many disappointments that guy lived, and Jesus how many disappointments he had, and we could have come up with several others, but we used those two examples. Now I want to take a minute, and we used a needlepoint uh, image. Think about a needlepoint. I know I've got some at home, or, or embroidery, where on one side it's a beautiful, beautiful tapestry. It might be a, a, a sunrise. It might be um, some script saying, be thankful. Um, but if you turn that needlepoint or embroidery over, what's it look like? <laughs> it has really very little image of what's on the front. The, all the needles, all the, the thread is going in different directions to give the different colors. And, and so on the back is the way we see our life with all of its ups and downs and the, the disappointments. But God made a promise to us that he would make our lives worth something by growing them and developing them and helping others. And so our disappointments become part of that ability for God to use us to accomplish his will, which is always for good. God's will is never that we should have disappointments or evil or struggles. No, he wants good. So we're going to look now as we close that first lesson with this idea that God uses our disappointments to develop us, to grow us. It's kind of like a friend of mine that's a bodybuilder from way back, and he said, no pain, no gain. Well, if we didn't have some disappointments, it may be that God's not able to use us in the way he would like to. So shouldn't we say thank you, Lord, for the disappointments? Because we know he's going to work it out for the good. And I say the good, not just my good. It might be for the good of someone else. Jesus didn't come so that he could have an easy life. He came for a purpose to bring hope 
to the world. <laughs> That's a pretty major thing to have on your shoulders. You're, you're going to save the world. And when he was carrying that cross, it, he was probably saying, well, why, Lord, why am I having to do it this way? His disappointments and his struggles were so that the whole world could be saved. Now, I know that's the ultimate example, but you look at the life of Joseph, of Moses, Abraham, Paul. God has always used good times and bad times in our life to weave together a picture or a needlepoint that is beautiful. But we don't always see the front. We just see all the lines going every which way. In fact, I, I have a jacket that was embroidered with the name of a golf course, and on the front it's just beautiful. On the back, they actually have a piece of cloth over it because it didn't look like the front. And they just kind of sewed it on and covered it all up because the back doesn't look like the front. And I hope you realize that what you see in your life may not be what God sees. So my counsel, God's counsel, Joseph's counsel, Jesus' counsel is to stay the course, remain faithful, and thank him for the disappointments before you even figure out how he worked it out for good, for someone else or for you. I probably have just covered everything in the rest of my lesson, but let me take a look here. Every believer faces disappointments. And God desires to utilize those times as opportunities for growth. Maybe our growth, maybe someone else's, or both. This is not to say that he creates these disappointments so that he can do something with it. But this life would be a major disappointment if there weren't hope because of what God has offered. So he isn't the one that causes disappointments, but he uses them. There's enough hatred in this world. There's enough uh, violence in this world that disappointments are going to affect us. And so God says, but don't worry. Remain faithful, and I'm going to work this all out. And he's an amazing weaver. How we respond to disappointments, ultimately how we behave in response, is an effective measure of how mature we are. Um, we can be, and I'm talking spiritually mature, if, if we don't respond well to disappointments and we just cave and we just give up and we say, oh, this is too hard, how can God use that? So the more mature we become spiritually, the more God is going to be able to use us so we stay the course. Disappointments are never pleasant, but they can be very advantageous in the process of spiritual growth. Now, this is a story, and I may have shared this. It, it's from the, uh, I think, the early 1900s. It might be the late 1800s. I can't remember the dates. But think of a wood tick for a minute. Okay, Get an image of a wood tick in your mind. And that wood tick, magnify it like 100 or 300 times, and it looks like a terrifying creature. If, if you even take a, a fly and magnify it enough, it becomes a horrible, scary creature. Well, a wood tick is a, a miniature, in my mind, image-wise, of a boll weevil. A boll weevil is the insect that ruins cotton. And so in the South, they had a lot of cotton fields, Alabama specifically, and the boll weevil just destroyed their crops. It was a terrible year. They lost everything, and they either had to close up shop and it would become a ghost town, or they had to figure out what to do. Well, enterprise, Alabama put up a monument many years later and it, it's like a, it looks like a Statue of Liberty and she's holding on top of her head a boll weevil. And that 
boll weevil or huge tick is actually memorialized in Enterprise, Alabama, right on Main Street. People drive around it because it was because of the boll weevil that ruined the cotton crop that actually caused so much economic destruction that they diversified and they didn't do it that way anymore where everything was cotton. They began to plant different things like corn, soybeans, and they diversified and became very, very prosperous in the process. And so they thought, what better way to remind ourselves of remaining faithful because the disappointing bull weevil didn't win. But they worked their way through it and God turned that picture into a beautiful picture of prosperity. That to me is a good example. And it leads me to this phrase, and I, I, I heard it. it, it is original. I heard it from a preacher or I read it in a book. But it's disappointments may be God's appointments. And I love the play on words as disappointments may be God's appointment to make something great happen. I know it doesn't seem like it at the, point, at the moment. When something's not going right or someone's made a bad decision, it seems like the world is coming to an end. But the key is, no matter how bad it is, keep moving forward in faithfulness. And God will make all things work together. Take a look at Romans 8 with me. Romans is in your New Testament, uh, right after the, the Gospels and Acts. And Romans chapter 8 gives us a promise that disappointments may be God's appointments. And I want us all to, to really take this to heart. Maybe next Thanksgiving, when we give thanks around the table, we can actually say, God, I, it was a real struggle but thank you so much for that disappointment I had this year because, because of it, this happened, or I grew, or we were able to touch the lives of someone. We may see it a year later. It might be 10 years. It might not be in this lifetime, but we don't know how God's making this picture so beautiful. Verse 28 in Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul writes to the church there and says, we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. That's a promise from God. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If God has called you, if Jesus is reaching into your life and, and plucking at your heartstrings, respond by saying, I want to live for you. I'm going to do everything I can to be faithful to you. Doesn't mean you have to become perfect overnight, does it? No, because God has allowed for our weakness. But he wants us to keep moving forward. So I hope you will answer God's call and then love him, worship him, engage. And when you do, all things work together for good, even our disappointments. I wish I could go on. I, I could have done four lessons on disappointments, but sometimes you got to shift gears. And I, I want to shift gears now to a definition. Yeah, when I look in the Webster definition of a word like love, it's going to give me choice one, choice two, choice three, and it's give the different context in which that word can be used. And it'll describe in human ways what love is, but you have to choose what the context is. The Bible defines love too. God has given us a definition of love through the Holy Spirit to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to just take a few moments today to say love is and then give you the choices. 
I, I think it's an enlightening lesson. It's helped me a lot. Uh, it was in 2005 that I may have done this on TV once before. But when, when I pull up an old lesson and I say, oh, what can I learn from this one? And is there anything that would help me in, you know, preparing for this, this 2022? And it ended up becoming a different lesson. But the fact is, is love is hasn't changed. First Corinthians 13 hasn't changed. But my understanding of it and my context has changed in 17 years. So let's take a look at it today of what love is. Um, our life journey, and I, I mentioned last week that we're beginning, in, and I've only got four lessons, so we're looking at gifts and healing that we can offer to others. Um, and next week I'm going to read uh, an essay about um, the, the road of life. And in this essay, it's, I, I've got a bicycle built for two. And I meet Jesus and, and I say, hey, you want to ride along? And so he climbs on the back seat and we're riding along and I'm, I'm in charge because I'm in the front seat. But I'm finding that he's suggesting I go this way. And that way, someone actually gave me forgiveness for something I'd done in my life. And then he said, well, let's go over this way. And I got... Gifts of healing, gifts of forgiveness, gifts of love. And so I had all these packages. And he says, let's give them away to the people we meet on our, on our road. And I began to trust him to where I let Jesus take control of the front seat. And so he chose the path. He says, now let's give these gifts away. Gifts of love and healing. So these lessons are designed with that in mind, just... As I'm going through life, I've been blessed. God has given me forgiveness, healing, love. And I'm going to try to share that with others. Because I, I've already received them, so they'll bless someone else's life. In 1 Corinthians 13, we see some gifts and talents that God has gifted to the church, especially the church in the first century. There are some gifts that are uh, miraculous in nature, and many of those have been done away with because they weren't needed anymore. Now we have gifts that last until he returns. And I have some of those gifts, but I don't have them all. Well, what are those gifts? And how do they relate to love? Well, that's the key. Let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. I think you'll see how I, I made this, I drew this conclusion. This chapter defines love, but it does so by saying what love is and what love is not. It describes it. 13. That's in your New Testament again. And you may want to keep your finger on it or put a piece of paper in there because we're going to refer back to 13 several times. But we're going to look at the first three verses. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned or become a martyr, but have not love, I gain nothing. So we have some gifts here already. And they're real gifts from the, the first century church. This idea of tongues. That took place in Acts chapter 2 when God had uh, the apostles speak to many different people from other nations in their language. But they only spoke once and they all understood it. That's a, a miracle of speaking in tongues. That, if it's not accompanied with love, which we haven't described yet, it's of no value. That gift means nothing. You're just like a noisy gong. 
And if you have great wisdom and understanding and, and actually prophecy, but don't love, it means nothing. So it's so important that we understand this. And I looked for a passage this morning and I didn't have my concordance, so I, I didn't find it. But there's a place in the Gospels where some very religious people are saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and did we not cast out demons in your name? But Jesus said, if you didn't follow what I said, which is God's command, I never knew you. You can profess to believe in Jesus, but if in fact it's not accompanied with the love that God has shown to us, to others, he doesn't recognize you. Wow, that's a powerful three verses, isn't it? So we better get the love part right first before we kind of figure out what God gifted us with to help his cause. I hope that makes sense to you. It's like getting the cart before the horse. If we try to be, you know, the best speaker in tongues, if we try to be the healer, or we try to be the big prophet, but we haven't done the love work, then we're just a noisy gong. Now, I've got some ideas of lesson topics for each one of these, but spiritual gifts are useless without love. And Tongues, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, faith, giving, being a martyr. Love is the common ingredient in all spiritual gifts. It empowers our gifts to be useful. In chapter 12, Paul had directed the church in Corinth, that's the one right before chapter 13 that we're reading, to use these gifts in a, an orderly way. They were starting to bicker and fight. In chapter 14, the same thing comes up. This is a, a letter of instruction to the church on how to behave. And it's, it's really neat to see that he says, well, I guess I, we need to go back to square one. Do you know what love is? So that they can begin to show love to one another rather than competition to be the best in the church. So where does love come from that makes it useful? Well, I'm, I'm doing a one-verser, and it's not proof texting, but in 1 John 4, 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now this is John the Apostle speaking on behalf of Jesus. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Think about that. Love is from God the Father. And so, if we love one another, we're allowing God to work through us. But if we bicker and fight and have a, a, a knockdown drag out, God's not involved in that. He doesn't want any part of that. You become a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Because love is the ingredient that flows through all of this, because love is from God. Now, there are several descriptions, and we're actually getting running out of time. So I want you to do a little homework, and next week we'll just pick up where we left off. The Apostle Paul describes love. Um, and I've got a chart that says, love is, or love does, and a list of things that he points to in these verses. And then I've got a list of love is not, love does not, and a list of things that he shows. So what I'm going to do, I've only got enough time to just read through that, and then I want you to go through and read chapter 13 for next week as we can continue to look at the description of love according to God. God is love. God Love comes from God, so we need to understand the description of what God, love is so that we can be like God. We can share our good fortune. 
Starting verse 4. No, oh, I'm in 1 John. We'll have time. It, this is such a short little chapter, and that's why I'm asking you to read it yourself um, through the week as we try to make application. Love is patient, kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That is where we're going to pick up next week. Those descriptions, how comfortable are you that they're a part of your life? Is that the way you treat others and the way you want others to treat you? Love is patient and kind. Boy, we've, we've got our work cut out for us, don't we? Love keeps no record of wrongs. What, you know what you said to me last week. I'm still mad. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. So I, I hope that's enough of a teaser that you want to come back next week. Because we're going to continue to look at love and how it is a blessing from God, but He wants it to be a blessing to others through us. Before I go, I want to remind you that you can study in the privacy of your home. We have a seven-lesson um, booklet series. that are, It's a basic course, and you have to have a Bible to do it. So if you don't have a Bible of your own, we can give you a hardcover English Standard Version Bible. Now, Alex, who's the main host on the program, he's the one that sends out the Bibles and the courses, and we'd be more than happy to send you one or both. Just let us know that you need it. You could write to Alex at uh, the Marquette Church of Christ, P.O. Box 372, or you can go on our webpage, letthebiblespeak.net, and you can contact Alex that way as well. Now, it's important you realize we're not going to charge you for this at all. And once you complete a booklet and you fill out the answer sheet, just mail it back to us. We'll record it, answer your questions, and send it back with the next booklet. I do hope it will be helpful to you to realize that there's more to understanding God's Word than just going to church and listening to the preacher on Sunday. That can be helpful. But the most important thing is that you engage in the study of His Word. So these, these ideas of booklets and all, they can only enhance your understanding. And I do hope you'll write to Alex, let him know you want to take that course, or visit with one of the churches in the Upper Peninsula. Thanks for being with me today. And God bless. In the